Hey, Byron, thanks for coming on the podcast. To kick things off, I think you should start by sharing your journey into machine learning and just the data space in general. Like, how did you get started um, and how did you break into the whole, whole arena? Yeah, sure thing. So I actually originally didn't come from a tech background. I had uh, what I call my, my first career in marketing. And kind of as I got went through that career, I started to realize how much I liked analytics started to get my feet wet and realized actually it's really the analytics and data that I care about a lot. And so I, I did kind of a hard pivot and reskilled into uh, data science and data analytics, learned SQL, learned Python, spent like a year and a half doing that kind of thing. And then um, started working as a consultant um, at a company called Servian in Australia. And that was kind of where I got um, started getting introduced to a lot of different type of work actually. So originally it started off as kind of dashboarding, BI type work um, in the beginning, because that's what's really common in our industry. But given my skill set, I started to get also ML gigs. And I, the way I like to describe it is I've touched every bit of the ML life cycle. So that's to say I've helped clients um, in terms of identifying use cases, solutions that drive value, all the way to building out models and putting those into production and setting up the infrastructure that sits alongside of that, including, you know, um, BI tools as well. So uh, that's kind of where I got my fee wet and I'm based in London now, um, but that's a slightly, I can leave that for another part of the conversation. Quick, quick follow-up question on this, yeah. uh, you know, th in the world of like data science and ML, there's like this, this almost cliche at, the, at this time, like people say that, you know, 80% of the work of the data scientist is to do data prep uh, for data training or for scoring and things like that. Is that your experience too, working as a practitioner in the ML world? Yes, definitely. It is absolutely true. <laughs> um, 80%? Is 80% the exact number? Was it 90? Is it 70? <laughs> I feel like that number fluctuates depending on who you talk to between 70 and 90%. Um, but it is a lot. It's the overwhelming majority of it. And um, I think if, if the wisest of us emphasize uh, good, clean data, um, uh, because it's, you know, an ML model is nothing without its data, really. So um, it's critical and essential to success. Yes, it's like train, like right, like the a big part of, of ML is like training, this machine learning training model, and then you're training it with data. So you better bring data that's representative of the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the outcomes you want, the prediction you want to make. Uh, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it seems like very, like very natural and normal that data prep would be, and it's normal that, and, and probably will always be that way. It's a huge part of machine learning. And it's probably the more complicated part because you have a lot of more people involved. Uh, data comes from different sources. And so you have to deal with the politics and just the access issues that around that. Um, when it comes down to actually developing an ML model, you're kind of, once you have the data, you're kind of on your own and you can do your thing and um, you can kind of run in stride. And a lot of times that's the shortest amount of time, uh, even if it does bring 90%. Yeah, but Plus, in my experience, like if you if you're doing good feature engineering, like you'd be surprised how far just regression can work, right? Like uh, it scales well, and um, so I think that like if you do a lot of data prep and, and even feature engineering, which I kind of consider as part of data prep, then I think uh, you can get quite far. And yeah. auto ML has gotten good too. Like you look at like auto ML, like that part of the pipeline. So assuming you have all the data and now you're trying to, like, what is the best model for me to, to use? Like, should I use a neural net? Should I use like log logistic regression? Should I use uh, trees or forest? Like the, the, the system could tell you which one you should use, right? You know? Uh, yeah, so it can go a long way. Yeah. It's really good in prototyping and uh, auto ML, that's kind of where at least we use it a lot is in those earliest stages to kind of help guide the way um, and it's super useful in that regard yeah so that stuff can be automated the data prep there's no auto data prep that would that yeah. maybe that's the holy grail it push a button and you know figures out how to you know, prepare your data for you but yeah we're very very far from that I think. yeah it would need to be like a, a slack bot that pings people it's like hey can you update this and clean this and like why is this out of date um i mean to segue a little bit to kind of our main topic like i'm curious like what the, in your eyes and your experience, like what the bridge between the ML and kind of the BI world is? Cause like a lot of times, like those are like different teams and organizations. Um, what's kind of your preferred stack um, that you have find kind of unifies 
both of those kind of worlds and, and cultures a little bit, how does SQL fit into it, um, you know, in the ML world, like, I'm just kind of curious on the, the organizational side of, of kind of unifying both of these ways of, of thinking. Yeah. So I would almost break up that kind of the, the data pie, if you will, uh, into like three pieces. I, I do think that, you know, you have BI and BI in a lot of organizations has been a really driving force. And certainly with clients I've worked with, um, they've been some of the first people to kind of uh, champion data engineering as a, as a practice, but for the purpose of BI, right? Um, ML kind of does that as well, but from its own angle, they're obviously not interested in dashboards as much as they are in machine learning models and driving a certain business case and a certain value. But um, both of them really come back to and depend on data engineering, whether that's like an actual team or just a capability, um, it's fundamental to both of them. And in some cases you do see, in a lot of cases, I think, you see this kind of uh, sort of sometimes odd couple relationship between data engineering in particular and data science. And um, it can be very adversarial at times, that, but they are kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. And I would say BI kind of fits in there as well as kind of like yet another side of the same coin because fundamentally we're interested in very similar things you're trying to take data you have aggregated and to enrich it and get value out of it. And a lot of times uh, you're building some of the same features. Like we call it features in machine learning. It might be called measures and dimensions in BI, but what's the difference really? There is a difference, but I think also it's a lot more similar than what people like to think. It's the same data, right? It's just a different lens, maybe a different orientation, different type of data modeling that, you know, that, that fits best different use cases. Uh, and I do feel we're going to talk about data modeling today at kind of striking balance. We're going to talk about semantic layers and all these things. But yeah, you, when you think about it, you know, um, the, the ML, the data used for ML, you know, training score is the same data fundamentally. It's the same like company business data of your, your company um, might not, might not be the same coverage like in terms of subject areas and entities, like you might have uh, entities that are, you know, much more important to ML or around which we want to do a lot more forecasting and predictions. But, um, and, you know, and, and BI is like more oriented towards the past, like understanding what's happening now in the past 90 days, you know, in the past uh, seasonality and ML is like really trying to make production based on what happened in the past, but yet it's all, it's all the same data. So it's like, why do we have to have a chasm, you know, in our data warehouse data tools? Like, why do we need to split the data pie? is an, yeah. an interesting topic. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I'd like to see more integration and, you know, I work with clients that are, are pushing towards that integration as well. And it is challenging because, because of the history of it and, um, sometimes because of where the data sits. Um, I guess when it, I don't know if this is an, a starting place or not, it's just an idea for another starting place with this. So this is the idea that um, Drew Bannon shared in the um, Apply conference uh, earlier in the year. He showed a diagram of his thinking. And I think I like it, but I kind of disagree with it as well um, to a certain extent, not to pick on Drew or anything. Um, but so there's this idea of like, okay, you have the data warehouse, you have your transformation and business logic. And from there uh, stems the semantic layer and the feature store. I would kind of, if I was drawing my own diagram of that, it would be transformation and business logic stems um, kind of is the semantic layer or could be the semantic layer. It overlays all of that. And then from there you can derive feature stories as well as what's needed for BI um, potentially. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense, right? Like when we think about fundamentally, what's a feature store and how, what are the properties of a feature store and how it relates to BI, right? So to me, feature store is very entity centric, right? Like, so there's like always, typically you're gonna have say an entity like a user, a user ID, and then bring a lot of features around that, uh, <clears throat> that entity. And the assumption is like you're making predictions for individual users <clears throat> and you're bringing the, the, the characteristic and the behavior and uh, uh, you know, the, the prop properties and attributes of a user and behavior of the user, like all around the user, so you can make predictions around, you know, user behavior, for instance. So that's not that far from like, you know, dimensional modeling 
and love yeah. or when you think about like the traditional bi like often you'll have um, this idea or there's these older concepts of data modeling best practices and one framework is dimensional modeling which is you know, facts and dimensions really and dimensions are nothing but <clears throat> in a lot of ways um kind of entity centric data models that bring all the attributes and properties of a user it doesn't have as much metrics and behavior those are more you know will be uh, so Kimball will say, put those in fact tables and then reference the dimension from the fact table. But I'm like, let's bring those facts in, you know, in the dimension. So that's part of the idea of like pushing this idea of dimensional modeling or entity centric uh, modeling further. Like how can we take facts, behavior, time series, like seven day, seven day bookings at Airbnb, 28 day, like, you know, how many bookings has the user done the past year? Uh, take a lot of these facts and denormalize this stuff into the, uh, the dimensions. Yeah, I think that point around denormalization is um, really attractive because, especially from an ML point of view, so if you think about your entities, right, um, like, I think there is that overlap between historically, like, uh, take it even further back to master data management, you're often talking about, okay, well, what are your business entities? And that's what you care about when you're looking at building machine learning models, because you're trying to aggregate to a certain level, to a certain grain, if you will and you want to predict on that. So do you want to provide a recommendation for a user? Do you want to um, predict demand for a product? You know, those are both entities within your business and you want to kind of slice your data in that way. That said, uh, you need that logic when you're rolling it up, when you're aggregating it. So it's nice to have a denormalized data set to start with so you can have a little bit more control over how you transform that data. Um, and I think that's sometimes some of the challenge if you are getting aggregated data as a, a machine learning engineer or data scientist, um, that might not be the right grain. That might not give you the full story. So starting from a point of denormalization is really handy because then you have more control over it. But that also seems like a place to start from with the semantic layer. At least that's kind of how I felt when I was using Looker. And that was kind of like, to be fair, that was my first introduction to the semantic layer was via Looker. So, I think I think it's a solid semantic layer as far as semantic layer goes, right? Uh, so I think LookML is a good. Um, I, th I think it like it captures the uh, the semantic layer problem. It's all when it all it's, it's complexity and glory and problems that kind of come with that too. But it's, I think uh, if you look at historical semantic layers like MicroStrategy projects or business objects universes like Looker, I think very much kind of uh, takes just a code first approach to um, to to the similar ideas of like a mapping. Yeah. Maybe we need to step back like, for the audience too. Like, what's the semantic layer we're talking about? Um, yeah. So maybe I'll try to do my definition. Maybe you add on to it or you do your own definition. But to me, the semantic layer is a little bit of a map of your your data models, right? So you tell the BI tool um, about your physical data structures and your data warehouse, your tables, your views, how those can be joined, join, and maybe you add some information. You had pretty business metadata so uh, pretty descriptions and labels for for columns maybe you add some um, some metrics in the form of aggregable dimension and then with with that you create a curated list of objects in the form of like call them metrics measures dimensions um, kind of like a menu right it becomes like a little bit of a menu to the restaurant where uh, users can pick off of that menu things like hey I want net sales uh, by country with a filter on, uh, you know, a, a certain market or a filter on a certain type of customer, right? And then they, they don't have to know how to write SQL. They don't have to know anything about the underlying data models or do they? But like the, pr the premise, I think the guarantee and the end goal of the semantic layer is to facilitate self-service uh, by adding this layer this, of semantic and metadata that uh, basically is a map to your physical data structures. I like the idea of it being a map um, in, in that, because I, I actually introduce it to people in, in particular, I work for a company called Contino and there's a lot of uh, history with DevOps at Contino. And so we have many people that work with Terraform. So kind of the analogy is uh, if you're thinking about Terraform, it's, it's one mapping to another. So I often talk about it in terms of it's um, config files that basically map to your SQL queries. So you're not writing the SQL queries, but you're defining it through um, through those config files in a way as kind of an introduction to what it does. But I think your point about 
mapping it is you can offer so much more through semantic layer in terms of uh, introducing understanding of how data joins together, introducing the idea of aggregate awareness, which I think is a really interesting topic when we talk about semantic layers and also cost reduction from a user point of view. Um, and maybe that's jumping ahead, but it's a, those are interesting concepts and they kind of, th that's the kind of stuff that gets me thinking about when it comes to ML, you know, there's a few things that you might want to be able to do from aggregate awareness point of view that are more tailored to machine learning. So, um, yeah, let's, let's explain what aggregate awareness is. I can, I can try my definition, but yeah. So if you have a map to the physical tables in your data warehouse, and then you have and maybe in some cases in your data warehouse, you might, you might share some, some aggregate, you might pre-compute some summary data sets it would be aggregated, it would be denormalized, or they would be, you know, a different rep physical representation of the data. And the semantic layer can know about, say, a metric and a dimension. And if the, it can know where in the warehouse it's more efficient to retrieve that metric and dimension. So if it's stored in different ways, it will take the most aggregated fastest table to answer the query, right? And that's a, that's a, an interesting property or feature of semantic layers. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's kind of like trying to get to the most optimal table, uh, given the query that you have, because oftentimes, you know, particularly in BI, if you, you query things, um, unless you had already modeled it, you wouldn't be querying the most optimal table or the optimal view. So having that knowledge baked into the semantic layer is quite handy. Yeah, so one thing, you know, talking, there's this blog post I wrote a while back. I don't know if you read it. It's like data set centric, um, I think, um, data modeling, basically saying that um, those semantics might better live into the transform layer, right? And that's a topic we can talk about, like striking the balance between how much logic and semantics should be pushed in the transform layer and materialized versus like um, and, uh, how much of that logic should live more on the retrieval and inside the, the BI tool. And there's some, some core issues with, um, you know, just listing out from that blog post, some core issues with a uh, semantic layer. One is it's proprietary, right? Typically it lives in your BI tool. If you have multiple BI tools, you, you cannot reuse uh, semantics typically, right? So if you, you have Tableau, you have Looker, you have Sigma, you have Superset, you have like four or five tools, and you have to duplicate that logic in a bunch of places. Um, and then there's just like change management is really difficult. So it's hard enough to like evolve your your data models, your Airflow DAGs, and your your um, DBT, you know, mountain of SQL code, and to keep a semantic layer atomically deployed with that is can be really challenging for models that are evolving quickly. Uh, so it's like, those are some of the, the challenges we have. And then, you know, users, uh, the, the premise that users can kind of just pick and drag and drop, uh, and they will self-serve if you provide the semantic layer, but the reality is like, they don't always understand and, uh, really what's happening. And they, they're, they're like, still like, oh, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is, is right or if it's going to work, you know, but striking like the balance, the right? I'll follow up with a, a question that's like, okay, if you take the extreme approach, always like an interesting like thought um, experiment to say, if we take the uh, extreme approach of say saying like, hey, we're going to take an OLTP model that's untransformed uh, or take like a database model that's very, very normalized. And then we're going to put like a lot of cement, like a very complex layer of LookML on top so that we can we don't do any transformation at that point. We just do like, you know, retrieval uh, queries. So that's, you know, so that's one extreme approach. The other extreme approach is the data set centric approach I've been, you know, advocating for, which is like create really concise, like very clear data sets to, to work with. So I think it's interesting to be like, okay, what's the balance? How much transformation denormalization we want to do in a transform layer? How much semantics we want to put in a retrieval, like, you know, BI layer. Have thoughts right. on that? Yeah. I don't know. Well, is that the difference between a thick and thin semantic layer? Uh, it, it, when you talk about the idea of a thick semantic layer, it's when you're coupling those two together, that uh, the transform and the retrieval together. That sounds like thick to me. Yeah. Um, like, I would say if you have like a dimensional model, the, the normal prescribed approach, I would say, in the past has been uh, to, to, to create dimensional models. Right, so facts and dimensions, so fairly simple, fairly denormalized, and then to put your semantic layer on top of your 
uh, star schemas or snowflake schemas. Yes. Yeah. So that would be thick to me, you know, like I would call that. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I guess I like the, so if you looked at like master data management, the type of modeling we're talking about, it, it does, uh, I mean, I'm not as old as uh, some of my seniors. Um, so people can tell me otherwise. But um, sorry, that wasn't a dig at you, Max. I would say I would qualify, uh, say like Kimball as like say the grandfather of data warehousing. But I'm, yeah, I'm, exactly. The parent, and and uh, it stems yeah. from a time when we didn't have the same kind of like compute resources that we do today. Yeah. And so we can start to look at the world in a different manner. And I think that's that's really attractive because those those queries and that modeling is really quite complex. Um, especially to build it out and retrieve it in all the various ways that you want to uh, do that. Because if you are starting from that point, uh, you have to then make the right two different queries if you want to build it for BI and if you want to build it for, for ML. Um, it might look very different. And also, I think the changes in the BI tools that we have um, and the introduction of like semantic layers kind of changes things uh, quite a bit because I remember when I first started doing BI, a lot of times the goal was to have highly uh, modeled data as an input just so it performs well. Um, mm -hmm. Just eking out performance in Tableau, for example, uh, was challenging because you wanted, you, were, you wanted it not to crash. Um, so you had to have highly normalized data. Um, yeah. But this stuff, as, yeah. Yeah. This stuff, I, like, I would say that stuff is kind of those ideas of like hey, doing it for performance. I think it's not a concern anymore right and then yeah yeah one thing i've been talking about is uh you know if you look at a parquet file it's a little bit like an inverted dimensional model in some ways so the the, the very kind of like uh the file format itself does its own uh summarization and is able to do like some of that performance gain, gain is represented inside the data segment as opposed to like in mm -hmm. the the data model. So I think yeah. it's less relevant and plus like compute is cheap, storage is cheap. Like, you know, I think uh, the, the performance is not the main concern. So now it's more about like, you know, the, the mental model, the retrieval, what's the right abstraction, you know, to, to work yeah. with. Yeah, I guess that I feel like that opens the door towards merging more operations together. Um, but then you have those historical kind of political factions, which I think yeah. that's the thing at least I see on a daily basis is the, it's those kind of political factions that drive some of the decisions. And mm, to me, I guess when I think of a, a, like a thin, if we thought about like thin versus thick semantic layer, if I was thinking about if you were going to combine into one semantic layer, like operations for ML ops, for example, or even at a minimum, like feature engineering um, and BI uh, uh, operations, like if you wanted to decorate metrics with URLs so that it can be surfaced in a dashboard. Uh, doing that kind of stuff um, in one layer sounds kind of attractive on some level, but also does do the political factions like really want that? Is that attractive to them from like a consumption point of view? Or would is it easier to have a decoupling uh, just to get agreement? Yeah, I think in, in general, it's like, it, it feels like it does make sense to push things upstream and data, right? To do the the cleaning and the normalization, bring the semantics. Like you kind of want to do push it as much of that logic upstream. And then uh, I, I think like with, I mean, if you have a single BI tool, I think it helps. But if you have multiple BI tools too, you're like, okay, how much layer do I want to put and replicate in mm -hmm. all my tools? And yeah. then those semantics too, like things like say, nice naming, labels, descriptions, uh, they can be used like in all the tooling downstream, whether it's like a feature store or, you know, someone hammering up data with a notebook. So you're like, okay, put those semantics upstreams. These data sets, I feel like we need them to like the highly denormalized data sets that people can easily reason about. It's kind of call it like, if you think about like what a data set, what a data set is, or, and maybe I need to like define data set because it's not a well-defined term, right? I'm, I'm thinking about very specific thing when I think about data set, but data set would be a, you know, a, a physical kind of a tabular uh, construct, right? A table or a view in the database that has a collection of metrics and dimensions that are very useful together and that are like kind of subject oriented, sort of subject centric in some way. So maybe that's something like 
everything that has to do with say, you know, a booking at, at Airbnb, like all, and all of the things that are interesting and important to consider around a booking. So such data set, I think is useful on its own as something that's easy to re reason about, something that's easy to bring into a BI tool, whether it's a superset data set, a Tableau extract, a uh, something that you use to create, to, you know, train your machine learning model or build, fill in your feature store. So I think there's like some, some clear value of having these things materialize, you know, um, and kind of simplify in the transform layer. Um, that's at least like that's the 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 part of the argument, right? Does that mean that we shouldn't have semantic layer? No, I think if you want to have more complex data models, dimensional models, and things like that, like um, then it's good to have a map somewhere of how these things can be joined. Yeah. Semantic is very useful, you know. Yeah, and you can't get away from the the legacy and history sometimes in a lot of organizations, um, and so that's yeah, it's very powerful. yeah. I think there, there's kind of this interesting tension, right, organizationally between like curation and like freedom where uh, like end users are like, look, I already just exposed the, the tables to me. I'll do the querying and just unblock myself. And if you like, you know, a lot of organizations want to spread data literacy, they teach everyone SQL. And so then it's like, then you level up in your data maturity, your data infrastructure. And then the, the data engineering team is like, we're going to provide curated data sets, you know, open a ticket if you need this metric attached to a data set uh, avoid the join, please. And then, then it's like also like a big cultural shift where it's like, well, what do you mean? I was doing all the SQL myself, um, you know, in, in my BI tool or, or wherever. Uh, and now I have to like go through this <laughs> ticketing <laughs> system or, or whatever it is in the middle just to do like, I just want to compute like average rights like, or average bookings. Like what's the problem, right? So I think that's also, I'm sure like a very, uh, yeah, yeah, just a source of tension. Yeah. It so one thing we also see in data science is data scientists are often, they're very keen and uh, some, sometimes the first people to model some data, but they do it in a very specific way and it may not be very useful for other applications, yet they still have a, a major feature that could be reused elsewhere. And so if it gets, if it, there is an option to populate it back into some sort of central place, it can make things a little bit more consistent across the organization. And, you know, we do see clients where one of the main driving factors is they have five different uh, interpretations of, you know, LTV, just picking a metric out of the air, and all three of them are different. <laughs> they can't all be different, right? Like, or, yeah, they like, or, or can they? <laughs> I think that's an interesting thing too. Like, you know, I, the, the, the thinking in like traditional BI and data warehousing was that the data team um, his role is in part to force consensus within the, or at least like Kimball's view is that the data team needs to force the department to agree on definition of things, uh, which is a very healthy and virtuous things, but the cost of consensus is very high, right? And it could be that, you know, that your marketing team, LTV is following me, their view on it is following me different of like how, I don't know, the sales team or like the finance team sees it for different reasons right and then that consensus cost might not be worth paying off or it's at the cost of like speed and you know being like the the, the more you push on that consensus the more i think uh, it makes things difficult and that makes the data team also responsible for you know different defining how yeah. we should understand the business so that my take on that is like um, I think the data team's role is to, to create kind of a mirror of the business in some ways. So the data really represent the mental model that exists. So if you have highly fragmented departments um, and no will to find consensus at the you know strategic level in the company, then have data marts. You know, have have them have their own playground and have like sales at LTV and marketing LTV, and just like know the definition of the two and assume they're different, uh, which is kind of great. Um, I wanted to bring up like the, like what, what's, what's a feature store and why is it finally yeah. so different, you know, than, than some of the construct and BI. And I know of a few things that yeah, I wanted to highlight. One is like, I would say like the entity centric and there's this idea of like bring a lot of behavioral data or what I would call like time bound metrics, like say, um, you know, 28 day visits, you know, seven day visits, like things like features that are like behavioral or metric and time bound inside 
a kind of entity centric model so that your user table has a bunch of, uh, you know, how many cancellation has this user done in the past year is very predictive of how, um, how likely they are to cancel. So we need to bring all these metrics, you know, these behaviors oriented in an entity centric way. And then I think there's a need to be to, for key retrieval right? in data warehousing or in general, we're like big scans, like we're going to do like, you know, generally we're like doing um, 90 days analytics. So we're like looking at behavior over time. We do big scans. I think there's a need for feature stores at the time of scoring uh, to be able to like do a key retrieval too, which is not something that data warehouses do very well. Uh, so like in terms of serving the data, there might be a different way, you know, or different constraints that uh, data warehouses might not serve as well. Okay. I'll, I'll let me cover off. Uh, there's, there's a lot there. Um, let me yeah. cover off maybe like what feature stores are. I, I thought you're, um, I'll, I actually have a question around key retrieval, but maybe I'll lay some found foundations around the idea of a feature store. So when we're talking about machine learning, if you're, if you're coming from BI and you haven't had a lot of time in machine learning, it's worth understanding that there's kind of three modes of, uh, of machine learning. Um, and there's different names for them, unfortunately. So it doesn't get confusing. So you mentioned scoring, um, scoring often refers to the idea of, uh, inference as in deploying the model, getting the output of the model and uh, labeling the data that's uh, coming in, generating a label, but doing it in a batch. So you have uh, a load of data that's come in in the last 24 hours, and you're going to score all of it in a batch setting. Um, so that's often referred to also as offline, um, and that's one mode of scoring uh, or deploying an ML model. Another mode is offline, or sorry, online. Apologies. Online. online, which is the idea that it, it's in unbound data source or streaming analytics, you have your data coming in live and uh, whether it's, you know, based on a fixed window or session, whatever it might be, you are scoring as that data is coming in. That's yeah, you online. Could, you could, that, could, that would be, you know, like fraud detection use case or, you know, at, at Lyft, there might be like a, you know, a driver who's like, you know, accepting a ride and you want to know what is the likelihood of this driver canceling the ride, you know, or to arrive yeah. on time or something. And then that's very on. Like, I need to know right now, I need to predict right yeah. now for this, youth, for this behavior, what might happen. Right? Yeah. Or like high frequency trading, uh, can be another example of like where it's you, streaming analytics. It's happening on a second by second basis, wherever you need that, uh, the result from the model immediately, uh, that's what will drive the online use case. Um, and by immediately it's like when the data is, is new, like unseen, and before like a couple of seconds or minutes ago, you then have another third one, which is on the edge, which mm, it's worth parking that for a while, uh, because that becomes a much more complex topic, but it's think of driverless cars, um, or IOT sensors, uh, in various places, either in your home or, uh, on your phone actually. So you will have models embedded on your phone because instead of like retrieving it through an API and like having the model in the cloud and querying the model, it's just lo it's located on your phone because some of those models are quite large or expensive to query for various reasons. So there's different reasons why you would have something at the edge. If you're talking about driverless cars, you want the response as quick as possible because it could mean a crash or something uh, worse. Um, so at least with offline and online, it gets tricky when you're trying to uh, unify them. And there's some companies that have had good attempts at trying to unify them. Tecton's a good example. Um, but they're kind of very two strictly different models in my mind. Because it's, it's the edge, like, like, just like the, to like discuss a tiny bit about the edge, like isn't the edge just kind of like an online and it just like the look, the locality of where the inference takes place is just happens to be on mobile or, you know, uh, or, uh, yeah, um, it is, it is, but, that is true. Like in my mind, the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. There's, I guess there's like constraints there of like pre-packaging the model and kind of shipping it and serving it. Yeah. Uh, but I guess you're just, instead of serving it from the cloud, you're serving it maybe from the device or, um, so it's similar as online. I would say it's like most similar to online, but slightly different in terms of how it's deployed and version. That's true. Yeah, it is. From a data like processing point of view, it's going to be similar to that. You have, you often try to shrink the size of the model 
So the model kind of changes and you yeah. might try to also use less features as a part of that potentially. And it can be more um, personalized too, right? So I guess that helps with the, the sizing of the model. You might have, you know, a model that's different for, you know, drivers and, and writers, you know, on, on Lyft, for instance, that more targeted. Yeah. yeah, it does, It depending on what you're doing, it could also become complex in that you might need to have data that's periodically transferred front to that device uh, in order to add it to the model. Um, so you'll have... Yeah. Online models don't always, it's not only the new data that's coming through that's important. Sometimes it's, it's um, data that doesn't change as frequently. So it yeah, might- I was gonna say, like if there's, uh, is there any difference, uh, what about systems where you have like a prediction being made and then uh, it's like this second order feedback loop type of thing where it's making a prediction, it's impacting, uh, it's like generating, it's causing some impact that needs to be captured and put back in the model, which generates a new proof. So you have like, and driver's cars are a little bit like that. You know, I imagine high frequency trading is a little bit like that too, where you make a decision that now impacts um, even the data that's coming in. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's like the the online training, like or what's it called again? It's like a persistent or con continuous training is like a real thing too. I think it's, it's still still in the uh, areas of yeah. academics right now. So I think I it's think more about data enrichment there, right? Like, so how can I enrich the flow to do a better prediction? But like. People, I don't think like train like the mute, the models don't mutate or don't change themselves as um, behavior happens. So, right? well, they can. Um, once you start getting into the idea of like reinforcement learning, um, and that's kind of I think training where you're going. Yeah. Like um, and uh, yeah, you can update the agent. Although that's to be fair, I don't think most of the industry, like at least as a consultant, I don't deal that much with that. I mean, it's fun stuff and I, I've, it's always nice to get those kind of gigs or like play around with that stuff. But most of our work uh, well, doesn't really involve that kind of model. There's some concern with that or like just mutable models. I think like even in terms of uh, uh, like from a legal point of view. So that's today when you ship a neural net, it's like it's, you know, it's already kind of pre-trained and pre-weighted and doesn't change. It's like an immutable, like the machine learning model is like immutable. And then if it is mutable, and it makes bad decisions, then uh, it's really hard to debug too. So I think like just from a data provenance, like predictability and, and uh, this idea like functional uh, approach to really understand what happened, it's like there's some, there's some risk and danger probably to do continuous training, it seems like in, in the industry. I haven't seen use cases for it um, at companies that I worked at. I'm sure some people play with it, you know, for for various reasons, but uh, it seems like not conventional. In like highly regulated industries, particularly where it has to deal with like the financial or health well-being of an individual, you probably wouldn't see that because there there needs to be the ability to, um, generally not in all countries, but generally speaking, uh, explain how a model came to a decision, or in yeah. some cases actually make sure that there's a person in in the middle making approving the decision that the model makes. Yeah, and then there's the whole Skynet idea too. Like, if you let the the, the, you know, the machine learning model learn, who knows what can happen? It just can uh, maybe start acting against you. you know? yeah. how, how do you how do you build a semantic layer for Skynet? That's the question. <laughs> it built its own. Yeah, it built its own. Um, so, so well, I think we, we, we talked about like key retrieval too. So my idea, there's like four online machine learning. Sometimes you need to do on the fly enrichment. And for that purpose, you need key retrieval. Maybe uh, okay. In yeah. store. Yes. Yeah, that is, that would be true. Yeah. I understand what you mean now. Um, yeah, so that means, so that would mean say a use case would be like, oh, you're trying to do fraud detection. Um, and then there's a transaction that happens. Someone books something on Airbnb, but maybe we don't have all the features that are required to to put in the model. So we would say this transaction, let's enrich it with behavioral data for that users over the past, uh, you know, that might not be in the app. So the, the mobile app might not know what their 28 day cancellation number is. So you would kind of enrich uh, the things so that you can put in the model and do a more complex inference with, with more input data, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. From like a streaming analytics point of view, you're kind of talking about like a side input if you're speaking yeah. like Apache beam language. Um, yeah. So 
typically when we're talking about feature stores, it, it's in one of the two modalities. It's usually not in like online training or um, at the edge. We're usually referring to it in offline or online. Um, and <clears throat> I think a key few different, I, some people ha have used it just to kind of refer to a mark that serves ML. And in some ways that's not an unfair <laughs> assertion that it that's what it is but i think there are a few key things that need to happen in a feature store um, one is that a feature store needs to be oriented to an entity so you know you're predicting on the basis of uh product demand on personalizing something so you have two entities in those cases so you're predicting to that entity um so that's the main key point the second key point is you need to be able to go back in time um, and that's true across other uh, data models, but this is really quite key in that you want to be able to uh, add a feature and then train on past data so that a model in the past that you trained on, like let's say you trained on data from 2021 and you're able to add a new feature and you want to compare it, uh, your model trained on that same time frame, but using this new feature in right. addition to what you had before. So that time travel is really critical uh, to the operation as well. And then there's other features such as like the ability to search for uh, features um, and make it make sure that like data scientists aren't you recreating the same feature many, many times and doing it inaccurately when actually they should be the same feature. And this does happen quite regularly. It's not unusual to see that happen. Um, so there's that uh, along with uh, the idea of feature versioning, which I think that last one, feature versioning, I don't really feel like that's a solved problem at all. Um, it's done kind of in an ad hoc way and it's it's a bit clumsy at the moment. There's not like a great tool to accomplish that. Yeah, it, and it depends on the source being kind of version. So we were talking about um, data history, lineage, predictability, be, being able to basically explain why a model made a certain prediction. Right. So then yeah. you, that means you need to be able to answer the question of how was this model trained and you need to answer what was the data set that was prepared and how was it prepared? And often that will, you know, you start pulling and you're like, oh, well, it was done from the feature store, but like, wait, the feature store, I was the feature store built, you know, so you need to know, understand that. And then, oh, it turns out it was built on top of a complex airflow DAG that also needs to be version. So we need to have uh, this whole traceability of ML depends on highly, yeah, a, a lot of hygiene on the data engineering front on the whole pipeline from like raw systems, raw events, all the way to, you know, where the, the inference happens and the scoring happens, which is kind of a, I think like few organizations can full, would be able to fully retrain a model exactly like it had been trained before and really un understand, you know, what, where every single row came from originally. This is still a journey a lot of organizations are going on. Yeah. I think it is, yep. it is a challenge. Yeah. Um, there you need to have a very deterministic functional batchy approach where you can explain how every data block, you know, in your data warehouse was built and be able to go and rebuild that, which is, you know, some of the stuff I talk about in functional data engineering blog posts and, uh, you know, talks I've given in the past, but, um, but it's so easy to kind of break that lineage and functional chain. Right, and it does happen all the time. Someone would just, just do a mutation or delete a data set, or replace it, and, and flush the code, and you know, it's gone forever. <laughs> we'll never know how we got to this data. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. How? Um, so think about feature store some more. So I think one thing we haven't talked about is the entanglement of some of this stuff with uh, experimentation too, and metric stores. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. I don't know how much you've been exposed to the experimentation framework frameworks too, but it depends um, on what you mean by that. I've, I've, I've had conversations where it's kind of like, we're talking about two different things when we may, when we say experimentation, so like, yeah, but mostly like AB testing type infrastructure is what I'm yeah. thinking about. And I'm going to try to explain like why it's and how it's entangled, but, um, you know, we're talking about entity centric and, uh, attributes and and a uh, metric. So if you're going to have something that, um, that say like uh, we're, we're trying, we're, so say we want to ship a new feature, right? Button red, button blue, like change the color of the button and uh, try to understand the, how it affects the likelihood of people to click on that button. So that's your 
your classic kind of treatment and control, like AB tests, simple things. Um, I think really often when you run an experiment, you want to understand not just like the likelihood of clicking on the button, but like the likelihood to cancel or book or how much time they're going to spend on the website, right? So then we're thinking about a lot of metrics that are attached, that are behavioral, that we care about, call them like KPIs that are behavioral, that are really important, that also, in this case, are also very user centric, right? Because we're running an experiment, we're trying to predict, we're trying to understand like how certain changes affect uh, user behavior holistically. So now you're like, oh, well, so if you're gonna go and, uh, you know, run this experiment, then you need to have, you know, an exposure table that says who got exposed to this experiment, you know, who was in the treatment, the control. So you need some a feature flag, you need to like wire people a certain way to the treatment or the different treatments and the control. Uh, and then at the end of all of this, you want to compute, guess what, a bunch of behavioral data, it just it just happens that you want to segment it by, you know, tre treatment ABC or control. But like now those feature stores seem like highly useful, right? It's a, are reusable. So, so, and very related to the, you know, we have these entity centric metric behavioral metrics. Uh, many of them are going to be very useful for the experiment. Also very useful for features. Should it be the same infrastructure, right? I, I think with Airbnb, at Airbnb with something like Minerva, I think we try to, to kind of um, reuse as much as possible, but there's a, it's, it's, it's difficult because a different group of people don't care exactly about the same KPI or metrics or behaviors. So I don't know if you've seen that entanglement too, you know, of, uh, you know, trying to find a unified model for features, BI, and maybe experimentation. Um, yeah, no, I haven't. And I feel like experimentation frameworks are probably the, feel like they're the most challenging to bring into this because at least in, in, in my world where I've seen experimentation frameworks most used is usually in the world of like CRMs and, and marketing analytics. And there's such like specific dedicated uh, tools that tie into also, you know, how you, how you run websites um, and run applications that they're, they're so tightly coupled with it. Yeah, I guess it would be nice to sync some of that information back into a feature story. I think it could be really useful. Like from a data science perspective, I could see that as being something I'd want to explore. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not, I, I would wonder how you, does the feature store serve the means of those doing the tests in a useful way? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's also this idea of like data mesh and the idea of like contributing back to a centralized source, which I think is always kind of difficult in organizations to get, um, you know, if you're talking about the idea, not to throw another buzzword into this conversation, but I just didn't put my foot in it. I think, I think we, should, we should go there. But yeah, I think it goes back to the idea of like when I was talking about the cost of consensus too. So if you try to yeah. create a unified model where you want to share as much as possible, right? It's like, yeah. as engineers are like, oh my God, we don't want to do the same work twice. Like, don't repeat yourself. Let's have some really dry stuff. Let's have some really clear definition for things. Let's agree on what a booking is, or what the KPI for behavioral, behavioral user are and have consistency everywhere. The cost of like forcing everyone to a central system and agree on definition and on a way of doing things and like, and serving the lowest common denominator. Sometimes it's just like, you know what, just go build your damn, you know, experimentation framework, build it how you need it to be. And we're going to build a feature store. It's going to be great. And when BI people can go and build their, their things. And we'll talk later about like where uh, things mismatch and uh, you know, and, and sometimes like for consensus, you need to suffer from not having had the consensus. You need to suffer from like, departments that don't agree on metric definition to justify the work of like trying to, to create the right level of consensus at the right time. But starting yeah. with that constraint yeah. upfront is brutal. Like I, th I think a lot of people are like, why are we even like, why are you forcing me to care about, you know, what the data science team cares about right now? Like it yeah. Yeah, doesn't feel right in some cases. Yeah. It does feel like there's kind of that ebb and flow between um, centralization, decentralization over time and that, I wonder if that will always be there, that we'll always kind of con contract in and out on that point. Let's go, let's go to data mesh too. So I caught you in a previous, uh, I was watching some of your content and then there's a conversation on YouTube there, which, which 
put in the show notes, uh, where I think we agree on something about data mesh, which is they did a really good job at explaining some of the major pain points around uh, uh, around data teams and around the like, data governance and just this idea too of data contracts that's emerging a little bit too. So curious on, on your take on the whole data mesh thing and maybe like if you, I love the term, like I think it could be so well, like, you know, I wish we could like redefine it and like re, uh, reuse the term data mesh and coin it in yeah. a different way. But curious on your take on it and if you could modify it in whatever way uh, take what's good about it and kind of augment, like, how would you kind of uh, make data mesh your own? So, yeah, I, f I feel like it it highlights kind of a pain points and things that a lot of people have experienced and tried to fix in different ways, but it does require a, a big cultural shift, I th especially for me, going back to kind of one point I said is the idea of contributing data back into a central place because it, it's you're trying to empower a business unit and i think that's that's a good thing but not everybody has literacy not everybody wants to contribute back also what what is the mechanism to contributing back as well so are we kind of labeling are we just putting a, a different label on things we already have is kind of my concern about it as a whole um it does raise some good points around um, governance in particular. And I think that's really important, especially as you do have centralized data sources where you might want to have different groups have access to them yet um, ensure, ensure and enforce that um, uh, policy and regulation is enforced whilst sharing that data more broadly. So I, I can see a lot of value in it. Um, when it comes to at least, I mean, I feel like this kind of brings back brings it back to the idea of semantic layer as well. I feel like something that is more uniform um, is kind of needed in order to really uphold the values of data mesh, but that doesn't exist. I don't feel like there's a tool that is like the data mesh tool right now. I think there's a, some tools that support it, but there's nothing that really kind of brings it to life. Um, I think you have to have a layer in between a lot of different organizational units and data sources in order that actually fulfills that function. And to me, that is kind of a semantic layer, but there, that, that specific semantic layer that actually enforces the ideals that data mesh lays out doesn't exist right now. And I certainly haven't seen data mesh really done well yet. Yeah, I think it's unclear too, if you read the content, like if you're like, okay, I want to do data mesh like today, this week, like where do I get started? Yeah. What do I do? Like, what's the, the yeah. library that I pip install, <laughs> right? And then, or yeah. how, what do I do? I've got my DBT project, my Airflow DAG, like what do I do? Um, I don't think it's prescriptive. And it's like, well, start calling your data set data products. Okay. Like we're going to call things different things now. Um, yeah. Call data warehouse. You can't use the term data warehouse anymore. I should like pull the tweet. Um, um, I, I got into a little bit of a feud with the data mesh people and then, uh, there's some really confusing tweets that come in, or at least confusing to me. Um, but yeah, so you can't, you have to call things, the things you have today, like call them different things. So that doesn't really help very much. I think there's something around like change management and, and like API yeah. to your data products, which is really mushy and unclear to me. It's like, okay, you got to put an API. Data product. How about this? It's SQL and the uh, DB API, right? It's it's it is my database connection, and yeah. SQL is the universal interface to data. So fine, okay. Let's call the interface, you know, SQL and database connector. So we're kind of the same place as we were, and then let's be rigorous about, you know, documenting our stuff and uh, not breaking shit that down that is downstream from that that is using the data set, right? So. So that part is like, hey, I've always, we've always been careful or like, you know, self-respecting data engineers are like, hey, I want to create a data set with a really good name and a nice, nice description and good column names. And I don't want to go and delete columns that are going to break people's yeah. stuff <laughs> down, right? There's nothing new. I think something that's new to me or something that, that we really need is um, like a little bit more uh, intent on people. If I'm using your data set, you need to know, right? And if, uh, and, uh, I think if I expose a data set, I need to put it in a box that's like, hey, this is a data set that people can use and can latch onto. 
And this is like my, uh, I call it my, my transition staging area. This is my work. Like you shouldn't connect to anything in the schema or anything in, in you know, uh, this area of the warehouse and then draw a circle. Like hey, this area is, I provide some guarantees around that. So that brings this idea of, you know, data contract that are, yeah, I think I've been too implicit in the past and large teams, mm -hmm. right? It's like the contract yeah. might be like, hey, if it's an Airbnb, if it's in a schema called core underscore something, it means it means it yeah. probably will be updated by someone. Yeah. If it breaks, someone will fix it. And we're not going to delete. We're not going to do destructive changes without looking at lineage and see who's downstream and kind of sending an, an email or something like that. But I think like more formal contract or implicit like, and more explicit kind of contract between a producer and consumer of data sets seems important. But at the same time, like, is that something that, you know, people are aching to do, you know, this week, this month, this year in their data team. I think your point about are they aching to do it is pertinent um, <laughs> because a lot of, a lot of these decisions, particularly in larger organizations, you know, it's, it's also driven by like uh, cost benefit. You know, is if, if a regulator is after them, they'll move. If there's, uh, if they're going to save a ton of money, they'll, they'll do something. Yeah. If they're going to generate a lot of money. They'll do something. Um, it's usually things like that. So I guess, that's where I kind of don't understand it. It's like, it, I can understand the value in it and intrinsically, but also like you mentioned, it's kind of, we've been doing it implicitly. Like we're trying, we're, but so like, why, why be explicit about it? what, where, or what to be explicit about, when to be explicit about what I think yeah. is like, what is the contract and do we need a contract? And if, if so, you know, what are the different terms that can go on that term sheet or in that contract? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting topic and how deliberate we want to do about it and have systems to do it versus just nomenclature, right? The nomenclature can go a long way. Yeah. You can just say like, oh, you know, if it's called core something in an organization, that means this set of guarantees. Yeah. Right. So that's a little bit, it's like still explicit, but uh, just nomenclature based and not necessarily like, uh, there's not a system keeping track of like, you know, who's on which side of what contract and where are all the clauses for each data product or data set. Yeah. Yeah. I guess from my, wearing my data set, uh, my data science hat, like you sit very closely aligned to business units uh, when you're in data science. And, um, Sometimes that can be kind of an isolating thing. And in some ways, that's maybe the aspect that I, I like about data mesh, not to kind of uh, highlight the downside of it, is the idea of contributing back to um, the broader group. Um, but that's also like, again, it goes back to uh, that that's oftentimes an implicit thing. You know, it's, it's down to sta standards and ways of working a lot of times rather than, you know, yeah. an enforced mechanism. The framework yeah. to do it, right? Like this part, uh, yeah. yeah so and also this understanding that you value, like you're, as, an in, as a data scientist, you're seen as valuable if you contribute back to other people more broadly as well. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that thing I said earlier about like opening a ticket. <laughs> Maybe it's like some type of trade where it's like, look, I want more data. <laughs> from from you uh or i want like fine you want me to push things back to the transform layer i'll help with that or request it but then i'm also gonna like give you some information or something it's like some interesting trade of yeah yeah i think there's a there's a big push at, you know in data mesh i think it's someone like what i was trying to the kind of reverse engineer their thinking and it looks like yeah, someone has read like the the, the, the material on the evolution of microservices architecture and wants to apply it to like, you know, to the data world. It's like, how do we make like every, every data set or set of data set, you know, a, a little bit of a microservice with like, you know, tighter contracts. And, but I think fundamentally these things are, are like very, very different. Like data's yeah. gravitational pull is very different and like service service is great. You can have like, you know, very um, specific services that accomplish very service tasks. They have their own data and compute and, and business logic. I think in data, it's like all the data is related to other data. It's a big, it's a, it's a big mesh. <laughs> it's a gigantic <laughs> mesh. Uh, so like it's it's hard to put super tight contracts on, on things. Um, here's a here's another like topic that to me, if I could recoin data mesh, what I would 
call it, you know, if you look at the five trend type stuff that are data integration across like B2B data integration, how we basically get data from our different like staff providers and partners, right? like there's all these data exchange and we've seen a lot of, um, like, you know, the way to do it now is like every tool expose the REST API and then five trend kind of, kind of part, like, you know, does the, the, the crazy, um, kind of effort of like going through that REST API and like sucking out the data out and putting it in your warehouse. Um, I think like there's this other idea that say hubs, my CRM, say HubSpot or Salesforce or my applicant tracking system for recruiting that they would just say like, Hey, we have all this data in our data warehouse or on Snowflake or on BigQuery. And guess what? We're going to give you direct access to those tables with the right world level security. And, and to me, I see this as a really cool idea for a data mesh. So you have like all the data is in the cloud data warehouse, all companies have it. And then we all have views into or nuggets of data and other people's systems. And that's a big kind of mesh of data warehouses uh, where the data doesn't need to be synchronized and hoarded and integrated as you know, through something like Fivetran or Airbyte, and it, ha it can just happen uh, in, in a more direct way at the data warehouse level. And it's like, call that the data mesh, recoin it, you know, and uh, <laughs> data governance, we'll deal with it in 10 years, you know. Yeah, I think what you see in BigQuery is, is like with, um, with those kind of views and also building and being able to separate it out and build customers who access that data, it does seem like it goes a long way towards uh, achieving what that aim is with data mesh. So in some ways, I guess that's why I feel like it, it's a largely been answered in some respects. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. find it a, an interesting concept because it's also very popular these days and we often get asked, um, about data mesh and hmm. there's an, in, in, there's a understanding that it's already been done sometimes, but, and, and it sort of has, but sort of hasn't. So. Yeah, relabeling. Like how much does like relabeling things help, right? It's yeah. like uh, I think I think it can help sometimes to change the way people think about things. But it's like okay, now I got to call this that, and I got to call this this other term, and we, we're all left with the same thing. Um, doesn't necessarily help yeah. all that much. Have you ever heard of a data integration hub? Uh, goodness, I mean, I data integration hub not as a not per se, but I can point to other technology, like other you know older things that you know. Uh, Master data management you mentioned earlier, that's kind of dead, right? We haven't heard of MDM all that much. And there was EAI, uh, Enterprise Application Integration. So the same yeah. idea of some sort of hub. And there was EII, which is, a, I forgot, an Enterprise Integration. I don't know, even know what the other, but it's <laughs> the same idea of a like, um, you know, virtual uh, data integration hub for B2B. Yeah. So what is that? But I'm curious, what is a data integration hub you're talking about? Well, I mean, it was kind of an attempt to introduce microservices to, uh, for data and kind of do what, uh, like when I first read data mesh, I was like, oh, this sounds a lot like data integration hub. Um, there's a few differences, but I think they're kind of coming from similar, um, similar streams of thought. Yep. One thing is for sure is like when we're going to have BTB, when we have BTB data transactions, like the contract, then the data contract and governance and the guarantees need to be really clear, right? So if uh, my CRM is exposing some snowflake tables to me, like that, yeah. I think we really need really clear governance and rigor and, you know, change management around these, these things. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So cool. Well, we, we well, saw a lot of things today. Like almost... we, solved the, we solved data mesh. We solved uh, semantic layers. Uh, we solved like kind of unifying uh, the, uh, the, just the ML, like data engineering with uh, the rest of the engineering. <laughs> so all the problems are solved now. No. <laughs> One day. Yes. <laughs> One day. Awesome. Uh, and you know, just want to be mindful of time. So any last thoughts um, on semantic layer, data mesh, anything, or even like what, you know, what, uh, I'm curious what tool you're excited about, uh, Byron, like that you've seen, um, or like an approach that, you know, it's like really exciting to you, but maybe still not fully baked yet. Um, 
Actually, to be honest, we already mentioned one thing that I'm quite keen about is the DBT semantic layer. I really am interested to see where that goes. And because I would like, it would be, I think there's a lot of potential to kind of break in some, or to make a version of it where there is uh, support for feature engineering in a way that's more specific to ML. And I think that could be quite attractive. And, you know, if you think about like what BigQuery does for ML, um, I wonder if you could start to bring that into BBT, uh, but for other uh, other data sources, not just BigQuery, for example. So for the one example, uh, there's the idea of a feature cross, which is the idea of joining two features and combining them. Yeah. Right. By default, you can do that with BigQuery ML, um, but you can also do that outside of BigQuery as well. Could you build it? So can you build dbt so that uh you query your underlying data source but you're also able to produce the feature cross for example that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, right. and on my side like a pointer or two like thinking about features and feature store so that's less you know i'm much more of a old school data warehouse bi person but i've been working really really close to the ml infrastructure team or been part of ml infrastructure team um wanted to point to the people at tecton I think, I think they're at tecton.ai, who um, that's the ex Michelangelo team out of uh, Uber. Um, and they've been doing probably the most thinking and building around feature stores and how they should work uh, online, offline, kind of unified model of online and offline. Uh, and, you know, these guys are very smart, smart and thinking very actively around like how do we um solve the feature store and how we solve like that that first layer and not limited to but like a really focused on a feature store to better power much better ml um so some pointers to if you if you're building a feature store you want to learn more about feature stores and how they work how they relate to the rest of the data world i think like i'm sure there's tons of resources around tecton you know kind of bleeding edge of this stuff yeah, couldn't agree more. I think they are a great company and a good resource for learning about feature stores. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, Byron. Um, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. your time. Uh, it was a good conversation. I'm sure we'll need to have you on again. So Happy to come back again. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Srini, for uh, coordinating. Yep.